Welcome everyone to Democracy in Retreat, Master Planning in a Warming World. I'm Jordan Steingart, the Program Manager of the Fuel Center at Columbia University, one of the many co-sponsors of today's event. Um, I'm just going to give you a few logistical details for today. Since we're on a bit of a tight schedule, we have a lot of people to hear from. Um, so we're going to hear from a few of the different co-sponsors, co-organizers here at the beginning, and then get started with our first panel. Um, a few notes, the poster in the back has a program on it as well, so feel free to pick one up and just take a look. And there's also name tags if you don't have one, as well as um, a sign-in sheet and a slip of paper with a Wi-Fi password if you need one. Um, okay, let's see. So coffee and food is available out there if you want to refill and restrooms as well. Water is around the corner. You can fill up your water bottle or cup. Um, I'm going to be keeping time, so pay attention because we have a lot to get through. I'm going to raise my hand at 10 minutes to tell you to wrap up. Um, we are going to have panel presentations, and then a response, and a moderated conversation, and open it up for Q&A. Um, so I'm going to introduce Josh Lewis from the Bywater Institute, Tulane, which is uh, one of their locations, and they very generously let us use their space today. So. Thanks so much. Uh, welcome everyone to the Tulane River and Coastal Center. Uh, again, I'm Josh Lewis, I'm the research director uh, at the Bywater Institute. So the Bywater Institute is a, uh, an institute of Tulane University uh, that works to develop interdisciplinary research initiatives around uh, the urban and coastal environment. We have uh, several different locations. Um, we have an uptown office. Um, this is sort of our downtown office, um, like a research campus. We also have a facility on the West Bank um, called a Studio in the Woods um, that some of you are familiar with. So the Bywater uh, Institute, it sort of had a precursor with the Center for Bioenvironmental Research. Um, so we've been around for about 30 years in different iterations. Um, but I, I have to say, uh, of all the events we posted in terms of you know, framing and content and the people brought together, um, this is one of the most exciting uh, topics and, and groups of people. Um, several mentors in the crowd today, and uh, some rabble rousers as well. Uh, so we're very pleased to, to have you all here. Um, I wanted to point out one thing. Um, for those of you that, that live here in New Orleans, um, we have a speaker series that Biowater is running uh, called Future City, Future Coast. Uh, we had the author, um, Elizabeth Rush, here um, a couple months ago. And on April 9th at 5.30 Uptown, uh, we're hosting Stuart Pickett, um, who's a urban ecologist. Um, he's done a lot of work in Baltimore. Um, so that'll be uptown April 9th at 5.30. You can find that info online. Um, one other sort of logistical thing, um, with the sort of topics that uh, we'll be discussing today, um, sometimes we can find ourselves at odds with one another on certain things. Um, so if you need to take a break or cool off if you want, uh, a, a more a quiet space. Um, you can find your way to the, the back of the building, um, and there's a sort of dark room in there. <laughs> um, which, yeah, having been a part of a, a, a few events around these sorts of topics, um, that, that could be useful. Um, and one other thing, um, my colleague um, Amy Leeson um, sends her regards. Um, she wasn't able to make it today. Uh, but the, the sort of work around uh, urban ecology, coastal planning, um, kind of the politics of knowledge around these things um, are kind of, uh, one of the big thrusts of, of what the Barwater is up to. And if you're curious about um, some of the work we're doing, you can look in the, the side of the main room in there, and there's a bunch of papers and, and reports and stuff like that, so feel free to take one with you. Um, so with that, again, welcome. Um, if I can need any help or answer any questions, please let me know. Thanks a lot. Uh, 
Uh, I'm Reinhold Martin. I direct the Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture uh, at Columbia University. One of, uh, what is it, eight, seven co-sponsors, co-organizers uh, of this event. And I'm just here uh, very, very quickly to thank everyone. First, to thank all of you for joining us here, for being here, for participating, those of you who are speaking, and those of you who are participating in other ways, uh, perhaps uh, more rousing, um, for coming to this amazing spot. And I also want uh, to give a little shout out to Captain Power, who seems to be now uh, busy uh, doing whatever Captain Power does okay. on the river. Um, so uh, the co-organizers of, uh, we should say, maybe masterminds of this uh, reflection on master planning and democracy. Uh, I also will each of each of uh, the co-organizers will be uh, moderating the panel, so you get to hear from everybody uh, um, as we go. Most of them, uh, but I just want to name the names: uh, Fallon Idu from University of New Orleans, uh, Andy Horowitz uh, from Tulane, and Carol Michael Reese uh, also from Tulane. So really, huge thanks to all of, of you for all the work that you've done. Uh, in collaboration with my colleagues uh, and the real masterminds on the Bill Center side, uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan Steingart, who you just met, and, and Jacob Moore, who is going to speak in a second. Uh, and then finally, just to, to name the other the, the, the names, uh, two uh, entities from the University of New Orleans, um, <clears throat> the Center for Hazards Assessment and Response and Response Technology, and the Planning and Urban Studies Department. And then five from Tulane, uh, the uh, School of Architecture, Bywater, um, uh, the Center for, for the Gulf South, and the Stone Center for Latin American, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, no more, uh, uh, Latin American Studies, and then, of course, the Mellon Program of Community Engaged Scholarship. So, uh, so for all of the above and, and everyone else who's, who's helped to make this possible, a huge uh, thank you uh, on, uh, from the Buell Center and from, from all the rest of us. Uh, we, we, we see a, this as one of our tasks in reflecting on infrastructure. Jacob's going to uh, say a bit more about that. To help build an infrastructure, an intellectual and institutional infrastructure for us to do the work that we do. And, and so, so this is but one uh, little piece uh, in, in, the, uh, in the systems that we've tried to set up. And Jacob's going to now say a bit more about how it might fit into uh, the larger uh, effort uh, for the Peel Center and, and, and in relation to the themes of the conference. So, so Jacob Moore is the Assistant Director of the Peel Center. Thank you, Reinhold. Um, I will try to make this quick, but um, just to explain a little bit about who Buell is and what we're doing here. Um, so, uh, I also want to thank, a lot of thanks, but really, Found Andy and Carol have been a delight to work with, um, and it's been really enlightening over the last uh, <coughs> several months. And I also want to thank Anthony Fontenot, who's been a special uh, sort of behind the scenes co-organizer as well. Um, it's been a years long conversation now, or a year plus long conversation, um, and uh, we're really excited to keep it going. So, so the Buell Center um, is a small research center uh, that's embedded within the architecture school at Columbia. Um, and we do sort of multi-year research projects that yield conferences, uh, books, uh, events of all sorts. Um, and so uh, I wanted to say really quickly something about the project that this, we come to this collaboration through the lens of this project called Power uh, Infrastructure in America. Um, so Power is a project that challenges participants to think about how infrastructure relates to life across a series of intersecting concerns. Um, that are many, but uh, some of them are the persistent uh, violence of racial capitalism, the harm being wrought by climate change and its facilitators, and the increasing threats to democracy at all levels of government uh, where it can be threatened around the world. Um, so we're doing this through uh, many forms, but uh, we just last week have launched a website that's trying to collect some of this work. Um, so through this website, but also offline, yeah, you can access some of the research we're trying to help support programming like this, other forms of collaboration, um, uh, editorial components, etc. So uh, through this website and elsewhere, um, we're trying to connect dots uh, through thinking about infrastructure um, um, and the ways that infrastructure uh, uh, forces things to intersect. So I don't say intersecting lightly or in passing. Um, 
want to no, look no further than the designated national emergency at the border, the executive designation of the national emergency at the border, um, the continued reliance on plastic water bottles in Flint, Michigan, um, or the uh, ongoing uh, uh, privatization of uh, the publicly owned power utility in Puerto Rico following <coughs> Hurricane Maria, to see the ways that power uh, uh, and its infrastructures organize, or one might say govern, which we can talk about today, um, today's multiple overlapping uh, uh, states of emergency, but also uh, uh, the, what, what we might understand to be outside of those states of emergency, which we can also talk about. Um, I also very quickly wanted to, to, to use an example of this intersection. Uh, just recently I was listening to um, someone who was reading Paul her speak, uh, in the last few months, Rihanna Gunright, whose people are calling her the, or she's calling herself, I think, the architect of the Green New Deal, with good reason. Um, and she gave a quick anecdote that I thought was really, uh, really concisely tied together also some of these intersections. Um, so just like a quick thought experiment to imagine uh, a coastal community, um, like the one that many of you are familiar with, I'm sure, or what many ones that uh, you are familiar with. Um, experiencing intense uh, climate emergency or increasing extreme weather events over the course of, let's say, the next 10 years. It's very easy to imagine uh, people of means, racially segregated, likely people of means, leaving that community um, uh, as the extreme weather events increase um, and uh, the municipal task base decreases as they depart, um, leaving behind people without the means to, uh, to manage their retreat, so to speak. Um, and what you end up having is a, uh, what can masquerade as a municipal tax or municipal finance emergency, a la Flint, uh, uh, that then can be designated a financial emergency. Emergency manager is brought in. We can talk about throughout the day the details. But uh, uh, the point is, the lines are not so long to connect what we often see as different types of emergency and different types of infrastructure are often doing, uh, doing that connecting. Um, and so, uh, uh, I think a, a really important conversation today about how how these different scenarios connect through conversations about climate and through conversations about uh, democracy and, and systems of governance. So um, uh, at Buell, that's what we're trying to study, um, and we're really, really, really excited to be here today to connect with uh, so many experts who have studied it so much more than us from different perspectives, many of which are rooted here uh, on the Gulf. Um, and so I think. I think I could speak a little bit more about the title of the conference, but um, it's probably more or less evidence. We're, we're uh, concerned with uh, uh, who the master is in master planning um, and uh, what it has to say about systems of governance uh, um, in and through these projects um, as they become more and more necessarily more and more frequent. So um, uh, I. I think I'll just let the panelists each describe in more detail the, uh, or the moderators, I should say, who are also, as Reinhold said, the co-organizers for today, more detail uh, perhaps what, what's in store during their panels. Um, and yeah, just in the effort of keeping things moving, I'll introduce Andy, who can give us one of the first panel. So Andy Horowitz is Assistant Professor of History at Tulane School of Liberal Arts, who specializes in modern American political, cultural, and environmental history. Horowitz's research, current research explores disasters and the questions they give rise to about race, class, community, trauma, inequality, the welfare state, urban and suburban development, extractive industry, and environmental change. He's writing a book under contract with Harvard University Press about Katrina's history, um, which I think he might speak about a little bit at the uh, beginning of the panel. So without further ado, uh, and we can take a look. Thanks. Unsettle the moral basis of capitalism and its pursuit of growth, 
the legitimacy of state action, which often hurts when it tries to help, and the processes of culture that give life its meaning as we try to make sense of wrenching change. So consider this timeline of local history. On August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina passed over metropolitan New Orleans. And during the storm, the federal levy system collapsed because it had not been constructed according to congressionally authorized standards. Then, New Orleans police officers shot and killed unarmed citizens. The New Orleans City Council voted to demolish the city's public housing developments. The Louisiana State Legislature voted to transform the city's public school system into a confederacy of charter schools. Congress voted to fund the largest housing recovery program in U.S. history. That program appropriated money to homeowners, but not to renters. New Orleans police officers arrested musicians for leading jazz funerals without permits, while violent crime plagued the city. Louisiana State University shut down New Orleans Public Charity Hospital, while rates of mental illness surged. The Army Corps of Engineers encircled the city with a new levy system, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency issued new flood insurance rate maps that released most homeowners from the requirement that they carry flood insurance, while the wetlands beyond the city walls continued to erode, and the city itself continued to sink. A decade after the storm, New Orleans' population had fallen from 485,000 to around 390,000, and the vast majority of those missing, nearly 100,000 people, were African American. We've come to refer to that sequence of events as Katrina. But for none of those effects was the hurricane the proximate cause. Calling that history Katrina thus threatens to obscure the policy decisions, the social arrangements, and the individual acts that were their true causes. And furthermore, these acts were not a series of reactions to the weather, but rather a series of contested responses to perceived risks that in every case predated the flood. Every day, we are faced with difficult choices, wrote the great New Orleans writer Kalamu Yassalam in 2006. Every day, we ask ourselves, what is this New Orleans we want to save? What is this New Orleans we are trying to save? And who are the we that are doing the saving? <coughs> Phrased differently, what is at risk here? By extension, what is at risk in many communities? Because this conference takes as a given that New Orleans is emblematic of many places. The point of this first panel is to consider that question of risk, how risk is or ought to be defined or managed, who is at risk, and what they are at risk of. And we're privileged to have a distinguished panel to start our discussion of these essential questions, so I'm going to introduce them briefly. Uh, Craig Colton is Professor of Geography at LSU. He's the author of several books that remain always within reach on my desk, including Unnatural Metropolis, Resting New Orleans from Nature, Perilous Place, Powerful Storms, Hurricane Protection in Coastal Louisiana, and Southern Waters, The Limits to Abundance. He's dedicated uh, most of the last 15 years to research on community resilience and adaptation, and continues to serve as a sartorial inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy Birch, you are, uh, is a coastal planner who works on community resilience and ecosystem management. Her research focuses on environmental vulnerability and innovative methods for community risk reduction. Her work in urban planning and environmental management has been supported by the Gulf Research Program of the National Academy of Sciences, the Water Institute of the Gulf, and the Department of Homeland Security. Zachary Lamb uh, is a Princeton Mellon Fellow in Urbanism and the Environment. His research focuses on the role of planning and design in shaping uneven vulnerability in the face of climate change. And Zach's current book project Making and Unmaking the Dry City examines flood mitigation in deltas in Louisiana and Bangladesh. Monique Burdan is the director of the Land, Memory Bank, and Seed Exchange and is a storyteller whose films and essays and other artworks document cultural and environmental changes and continuities in coastal Louisiana. Monique's a citizen of the United Home and Nation and is part of Another Gulf is Possible's core leadership circle working to envision just economies, vibrant communities, and sustainable ecologies. And finally, our respondent, uh, Liz Kozlov, is an assistant professor in the Department of Urban Planning and the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA. Her research explores the social dimensions of climate change, questions of environmental and climate justice, and how cities are adapting to extreme weather and sea level rise. And she's currently writing an ethnographic account of community-organized relocation after Hurricane Sandy titled Retreat, Moving to Higher Ground in a Climate-Changed City. 
with that. We have not discussed who's going to go first, but I think we should go in the order that perhaps you were expecting. So, Greg, can you say? Yeah, I'll first have to have some slides. <laughs> Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I love particularly being invited to come to New Orleans for almost any occasion, and particularly when I am invited to come to an event where I don't have to do any organization. I can roar in, drop in, and then I can retreat back to that room to the conclusion. So I, I thank the organizers for having me in. Today I want to answer, I want to discuss or address three questions, although I, as I went through my notes last night, I realized I don't answer any of them, but I'll, I'll try to uh, raise some additional questions or, or raise some criticisms about some of these issues. One, how, how, do we really know who is vulnerable in the coast? And then second, how do we include the marginalized in the planning process? And then what is the role of migration and mobility in the survival of Louisiana's coastal cultures? We've seen innumerable maps uh, they're available over the, the, the internet uh, that show vulnerable populations. But have we really identified vulnerability? And here I mean the sensitivity to these big disruptive events, not the biophysical or social hazards, not exposure to biophysical or social hazards. The standard approaches tend to use economic and demographic statistics that were not collected with the intent to gauge vulnerability. So at best, the proxy measures. And many of the researchers who use the same data to, to use data to map vulnerability then turn it around and use the same data to map resilience, which assumes the two traits are opposite ends of the same continuum. But some of the most vulnerable populations shown using the standard measures have proven to be exceptionally persistent in place because of their adaptive capacities. And in fact, are amazingly, are amazing, amazingly resilient through community networks and mobility. Coastal Louisiana provides stunning evidence of this. Furthermore, one of my uh, creative students just recently defended her dissertation and made a compelling case that the that qualitative method, methods, which are not part of the standard toolkit to measure vulnerability, can expose vulnerable groups who are t completely eclipsed using the standard methods. This is not to say that they are safe, or that they're economically, socially, or culturally out of peril. But her argument is that existing methods don't adequately map vulnerability. The proxy measures don't always capture some groups or expose some groups. Along with several other uh, capable graduate students over the several, last several years, we've examined community resilience after the BP oil gusser of 2010. In doing this, we did not rely on the standard numerical approaches. Rather, we trace the historical actions taken in communities to rebound after debilitating disasters, looking for the actual practices, the things people did that had been stored in social memory between uh, extreme events, and then rolled out before the Coast Guard or FEMA arrived in the wake of hurricanes or oil spills. These practices provide a much better indication of local resilient capacity, but they don't figure into the state's planning process which relies more on the customary vulnerability measures. By documenting actual practices, we hope to avoid the tendency to turn resilience into a public policy approach that passes responsibility back down to the community level and absolves government of its role in, in providing an ultimate safety net. We also wanted to steer clear of adopting a common definition that distorts the term of resilience to mean defiance, that is, we will not give in we are bigger and better than the storm. Excuse me. Proxy measures can be useful at the 10,000 foot level, comparing social conditions in different locations. But the prevailing notion in hazard research is extremely, uh, that extreme events are local and one size fits all planning and mit mitigation are not viable approaches. This suggests to me that vulnerability and resilience need to be identified and understood at the local level. How do we include marginalized people in the planning process? There are two basic issues here. The first is rooted in the state's administrative structure. CPRA, or the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, is an agency with primary responsibility to plan and oversee coastal protection and restoration efforts. It has no fundamental core responsibility to deal with people of the coast. 
although they are certainly not absent from the plans. Nonetheless, people, society, culture are secondary, both in terms of assessing risk, planning projects, and developing budgets to pay for those projects. CPRI does not have a core responsibility to transplant communities, nor does it budget to do so. The state has another agency, the, uh, the Office of Community Development, with primary responsibilities for addressing human needs. And they're attempting to align their programs with the master plan. But until the two agencies' missions are fully aligned and their programs integrated, there will remain discontinuities in terms of goals and implementation of the state uh, program. Long before CPRA, there was a group called the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana, which launched efforts in the late 1980s to address coastal land loss and encourage planning for restoration. This is from their 1989 report. This initial report was the result of a collaborative effort, scientists and grassroots participants working together. However, since the creation of CPRA, much of the master planning process has tended to be more top-down. Granted, there is an extensive uh, range of stakeholder engagement, and CPRA has deliberately sought to expand this aspect in each successive plan. But the engagement is, is typically limited to comments on drafts or plans prepared by technical experts. There are numerous stakeholder committees that have a voice, but industrial, urban, and navigation advocates have received extra weight through the sheer numbers of their, their presence on stakeholder committees and their financial ability to deploy professional advocates to speak on their behalf. Despite frequent assertions that culture matters, the master planning process contains no comparable effort uh, to map culture, to model threats to culture, or to formulate plans that explicitly seek to preserve or restore culture. Granted, one can argue that those uh, at risk are not just those exposed, but those who are neglected in the planning process. The vulnerable are those with inadequate voice in the planning. In a, in a related issue, early discussions of the land loss in the late 1980s and early 1990s define risk as a process created by climate change due to the burning of fossil fuels with resulting sea level rise, sediment diversion caused by human intervention to reduce flooding, and canal dredging by oil and gas operations. The Louisiana delegation, the Congress people from Louisiana, used the term climate change and fossil fuel induced global warming in their testimony in 1989-1990. Over time, however, climate change has generally dropped from the state policymakers' vocabulary and reports and plans naturalized the process as contributing to land loss and sea level rise. Those terms still remain in, in use. Uh, the changing terminology diminished the role of humans. Consequently, discussions now tend to avoid seeking solutions to the underlying causes. <coughs> Finally, stakeholder engagement often occurs late in the process. Ignoring the long-standing guidance of social impact assessment experts, engagement follows the initial plan. It does not typically permit participation in the initial formulation of the plans. This sequence results in what some call a democratic deficit. CPR is, is, is fundamentally devoid of staff and programs to address the cultural component of coastal land loss. Yet advocates for a more humanities-oriented approach and methods that allow for full participation argue for decisions rooted in deep cultural and social values and beliefs. Plans should reflect those values but currently there's no place for such consideration in the master plan, at least that I'm aware. Coastal residents, the third question is what is the role of mo migration and mobility? Coastal residents have been in motion for millennia. Prehistoric people followed the coast seaward as a delta built outward into the Gulf. Homa and Chittimacha indigenous people moved towards the ends of the bayous in the 1700s to escape deadly encounters with Europeans. People of African ancestry escaped enslavement by seeking refuge deep in the coastal wetlands. Acadians, exiled from their, their Canadian homes, uh, sought refuge uh, in, 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 the, in the wetlands and then sank new routes along the Mississippi, although they eventually moved into the wetlands as plantation owners nudged them aside during the, the, the sugar boom of the 19th century. Spain placed, placed Canary Island soldiers on the watery margins of empire and many remained after the colonial period to trap and harvest the resources in St. Bernard and Plaquemines parishes. Filipino shrimpers lived and worked on still communities in Veritaria Bay. And Vietnamese arrived after their horrific uh, diaspora in the 1970s and now worked the coast. Each of these marginalized communities 
were able to sustain themselves in the coastal marshes and inland swamps, peripheral to the mainstream economy and political structures. They demonstrated cultural resilience in a perilous place. But the master plan uh, oftentimes excludes such communities, and they're typically the most socially vulnerable with little voice in the planning process. Oops. Through both economic and geographic mobility, nonetheless, they have persisted in place, adapting their subsistence activities and livelihoods to previously unknown or at least unfamiliar natural resources. They were retreated to places of sanctuary, and in the last century, some retreated inland as storms destroyed communities like Chenier Caminata in 1893 and Manila Village in 1965. Our respondent will, has written a really compelling piece on the use of the term retreat, a term that stirs up much animosity here in coastal Louisiana. And in fact, and unfortunately, I would add it has come to mean failure, not adaptation. If we're to practice true participatory planning, we need to take the sentiments of the coastal residents and their attitude towards this term into account. And for this reason, I've taken on a mission to reacquaint coastal residents with their successful migrations in the past moving seaward in prehistory to stay within reach of coastal resources, and more recently moving landward, to taking sensible steps to ensure cultural survival. This is a match on the general trend of, of post office locations. Post offices are tied to population. As a, as a community's population decreases, post offices are closed. This shows the general trend since the 19th century of post office mo uh, movement in Louisiana, and only one has been towards the coast. After, after Katrina, I used the term transplanting communities to insert the notion that with care and cultivation, communities could arrive in, arise in different locations and thrive again, as they have done repeatedly in coastal Louisiana. Movement towards safety has been a successful cultural trait in, uh, among Louisiana's coastal residents. I hope we can rediscover this part of our cultural legacy and, with an increased and equivalent effort to restore and protect coastal cultures, that includes movement towards safety, that we might just make some real headway. Thank you. However, an architect. Uh, I'm an urban planner, um, and in particular, a coastal planner who focuses on community development and resilience within the coastal zone. Um, coastal. I am in also the interim managing director of the Coastal Sustainability Studio, which is a small, um, multidisciplinary research institute at LSU um, that engages uh, architects, landscape architects, civil engineers, but also geographers, psychologists sociologists and a range of disciplines um, to work on issues related to coastal resilience, but uh, as much, if not more recently, recognizing the links between coastal communities and inland communities and how these uh, shared fates are not necessarily separate, but are in fact uh, very much intertwined. Um, so I, in preparing for this talk, I thought through kind of what is the name, you know, the, the title of the session, which is what is at risk, who is at risk, but how should it be defined and managed, and really focused my discussion on that framework. Um, just to say first that uh, today NOAA and many other federal agencies recognize that 52% of the U.S. population lives within the coastal zone. Uh, and depending on how you define the coastal zone, those are very different numbers. Um, there are really kind of two separate definitions. There are those coastal shoreline communities, uh, or coastal shoreline counties really is how things are measured, uh, which is to say those counties that actually touch the coast. Uh, that holds about 20% of the population. The 52% number really comes in when we start to talk about coastal watersheds, which are 
all of those areas that drain into coastal waters. Um, and one thing I need to note is that uh, NOAA defines coastal shoreline counties as populations, or the people who live within them, are the populations most directly affected by the coast. Uh, they define coastal watersheds as those populations most directly affecting the coast. Um, I would start by saying that this is probably not a very good framework to think of. Um, within the last, or since 2010, we've had 10 one in a thousand year rain events. Almost all of them started offshore and moved inland. Um, so they were, co or they were near coastal inland communities that were flooded. And if you start to think of this, Houston after Harvey, um, Baton Rouge in 2016, uh, any number of other communities we can think of, these are coastal events that move inshore and then devastate inland communities. Um, uh, interesting, and we think of them as being very, very separate places. Um, interesting to note that the Census Bureau predicts that these areas, coastal watershed counties, will increase in population by 9% which means more than 60% of the U.S. population will live in these places within the next, or by 2020 census. Um, so I would start by arguing first that who or what is at risk is A, the majority of the population, um, but also those, air, those kind of coupled coastal inland systems, that we really need to be thinking about this as a framework for how we reduce risk and vulnerability. Um, and it gets down to kind of the finest grain. Uh, even modeling, if we think about environmental modeling, we think about flood modeling, coastal modeling is completely separate from riverine modeling. They do not today really join in any way. So if you have a coastal storm surge, it is very hard to predict what your inland flooding is gonna look like. So even at that level, we're not talking to each other. And, and certainly through the planning um, and community development framework, we are not. Um, here we go. So, uh, as I said, I am a New Orleans resident, or I did not say that, but I am a New Orleans resident. I have lived here for 20 years. It is very easy for me to imagine the city of New Orleans as being completely separate from the rest of the state of Louisiana. It is only the fact that I teach in Baton Rouge and work further upriver that I uh, kind of pay attention to some of these facts. Um, and it's quite a bit of the work we've been doing through the CSS lately um, focuses on these connections. Um, this idea that A, coastal processes are, are in fact impacting what is happening inland, but also that those coastal processes are moving further inland. So these impacts are fur happening further and further, or closer and closer to our inland communities. Um, that the river systems and the water systems that are upstream also have a significant impact on coastal watersheds. This was recognized. Um, the work we've been doing, or some of the work we've been doing recently, focuses in particular on East Baton Rouge, Livingston, Ascension, and Tangipahoa parishes, uh, which are inland, are considered inland parishes, uh, but have recently been impacted by coastal processes. Um, and just to kind of drive this home, uh, this is a project, this is the NOAA sea level rise viewer. This is with sea, three feet of sea level rise, which I think for Louisiana is a conservative estimate. This is not with storm surge. This is just what the coastline would look like with three feet of sea level rise. Where suddenly we have a shoreline that is lapping at the edges of the fastest growing communities in the state of Louisiana. If you think about places like Denham Springs and Gonzales and Prairieville, this is a coastline that starts to encroach very close to these places. Um, and these are places that have been developing without any thought to coastal issues. Sea level rise, climate change. Um, for the most part, the standard is slab on grade, you know, and it, it is very much in doing this work. I realize very much a process of economics. It's cheaper to build that way, and we don't think of these as places that will be impacted by climate change, so we don't worry about it. Uh, so, just to give a few details about the 2016 storm that nobody remembers, um, this is Baton Rouge in August 2016. It's important to note that Baton Rouge had been experiencing a, a series of events that can and are, through research, related to climate change, which is before August 2016, the summer had been very dry, what effectively in a place like Louisiana would be considered a drought. 
We then had five times the August and average rain in two days, three days really. Um, which is to say, usually in the month of August, you would have six inches of rain. There was 32 inches of rain in three days. And then it didn't rain again for six weeks. So the system is thrown out of balance because you have kind of dry drought conditions followed by heavy rain events, which are becoming more frequent and are expected to be, continue to become more frequent. Um, so what does this mean in the city of Baton Rouge? Um, 11, 000, more than 11,000 people were in shelters. Uh, 30,000 people were rescued from their homes and cars. It's important to note that 30,000, many of those people were rescued from the interstate highway system, which was flooded. Um, and also important to note that evacuation is something that we think very much about in the coastal zone and almost not at all in inland communities. And so people got in their cars trying to escape water and had no idea where to go or what to do. And I think the officials really had no idea where to tell them to go because they didn't know what would flood and why. And oftentimes it was the roads that caused the flooding. Um, also of note is that of more than 90,000 homes that were flooded, only 11% had flood insurance. Because it has very much been believed that flooding was not an issue that was facing a place like Baton Rouge or its suburbs. Um, so what we have done is look into what this means uh, and, and really how, as the first step, how you can start thinking through um, shifting these paradigms to try and reduce risk within these places. Um, so, first and foremost, um, suburban expansion, and, and I'm going to go back to what Andy said, which is he said, people seem to think that New Orleans is emblematic of the United States. I would argue that Baton Rouge is em emblematic of most of the United States. Uh, that, you know, not right on the shoreline, but these kind of further inland communities that don't really see that they have risk. Um, Suburban expansion, highway building, all of these kinds of things are fairly common across the United States in communities that are experiencing more flooding. Uh, one thing we did was go in and look at the kind of what is happening, what does that mean to have this kind of typical American style of development. Uh, in Baton Rouge, it means you moved further and further away from the core of the city, which was to move into lower and lower areas. The high ground, of course, is by the river, and so the old city is the highest area. Uh, and as you can see, you're moving into the floodplains of multiple river systems, into the Amy and the Comey river systems. Um, also, as you moved further out, those houses were also less likely to be elevated um, because new building stuff um, is, uh, means that it's kind of slab on grade. Also, the houses are getting bigger and the lots are getting smaller. So you have more impervious surface over time. Um, also, to be clear, a lack of design vision. So the picture on the left is a map from the um, Harlan Bartholomew uh, Master Plan for the City of Baton Rouge, which said there is a zone in the middle of the city that should be left green space to allow for floodways and flooding. Of course, in 1948, they knew that adequate drainage was a significant problem in Baton Rouge. This is the same area there. And to the right, you can see what that looks like today. There is zero natural landscape left, and it is a system that is bound to fail, and fails regularly. Um, the other thing, of course, is that we never have enough funding or resources for the part of the process whereby you can actually reduce risk, which is the long-term planning and work on the ground. Um, and so as I start to run out of time, um, thinking through uh, kind of what does this mean, even to go back to some of these, I, I don't think it's as clear cut as to say it's a cultural or economic or environmental problem. I think all of these show that it is all of those problems. <coughs> uh, that it is an economic shift that needs to occur. occur. Um, that it is an environmental shift, of course, but it is also an architectural one. There is a need, um, and through work that I've done with Shirley Laska, who's here in, in the room, uh, there is a need to shift how we build even at the site level. Um, to recognize the vulnerabilities within the environment and that those vulnerabilities go further inland and further out of the historic core of the city than we thought before. Uh, and we need to in incorporate those into our development patterns. Um, to get just quickly to the question of management, um, I think first and foremost, it is at the watershed scale. 
we have to think about how water flows through an entire system, which is not easy to do. Um, in Baton Rouge, those uh, outlying areas are the fastest growing areas. Uh, places like Zachary and Denham Springs are on the edge and really need to figure out today as they're booming in development how to hold on to water as long as possible so it doesn't end up downstream. Um, there needs to be a coupling of these coastal risk rearing systems in both modeling and community development um, that we need to recognize variation across regions. That's social vulnerability or social variation. There are long-held practices for, for resilience that are rarely tapped into, as Craig mentioned. Um, there are places within a system where you need to, again, hang on to the water. There's other places where you need to get it out as fast as possible. And that becomes a much more nuanced approach to how we deal with resources than what we use today. Um, we also need to think about multi-use infrastructure. How can these things that we build improve quality of life at the same time that they are uh, reducing, say, flood risk. And finally, there absolutely needs to be a community-engaged design practice. It is not okay to ask people their opinions after the decisions have been made about projects. We need to engage communities from the very beginning, as messy and hard as that is to do, and then take those recommendations and incorporate them. Because if nothing else, there are never enough resources to do everything we need to do. And we have to be able to talk to a community about what the definition of their community is and what their priorities are moving forward. And with that. Accentuate the lowland idea, which in New Orleans 
we, seems inappropriate, right? Which, I, which is basically to say, we don't want to remind people that they live in a swamp. And so that was the sort of like, the, the driving ethos for, for generations of development in New Orleans. Um, and so that developed what I, what I have come to call the, this dry city approach. And, and then in, in recent years, we've really come to understand that this dry city approach has some radical, radical problems to it, right? So it's both, and I sort of put those problems in two buckets. On one hand, that, that, that the sort of urbanization patterns that, gener that are generated by the dry city approach are unwise, that is, they sort of generate all manner of socio-ecological uh, socio problems that were not sort of anticipated at the front end, um, and that they're deeply unjust, that the costs and benefits of those projects tend to, to flow uh, very unevenly, uh, uh, sort of disadvantaging the most already disadvantaged members of society. And so, in recent years, there's been this sort of conversation about a new paradigm of, of uh, urban flood management, or water management that's, that's often described in these kind of binary terms, right? We're shifting from gray to green, from hard to soft, from vertical to horizontal, from a sort of modernizing approach to a restorative approach, from a sort of adversarial approach to a more harmonious approach, right? And, and again, design has been a major part of that, of that conversation. And the sort of two components that I, I saw both in DACA and New Orleans and many other similarly situated cities is on one hand to sort of realign the relationship between levied cities and their delta landscapes, and then on the other hand, kind of soften the landscape inside the levees to accommodate and uh, retain and infiltrate stormwater more effectively. So these are just a couple of the projects, recent projects here in, in uh, South Louisiana that have, that have taken these, these approaches, right? And, the, and in both cases, uh, so we have the Changing Course Competition above, which was a, a, a Rockefeller Foundation and, and other funded, uh, philanthropically funded project to sort of reimagine the lower, the lower uh, Mississippi Delta, and then the Urban Water Plan uh, below. So uh, in both cases, uh, design was a major component. Designers were, were major components of these conversations. And so I talked to a bunch of folks who were involved in these processes as part of this research project, and sort of came to, on one hand, what are the contributions that people see as, as where do designers fit in these processes and where do they uh, allow sort of new, new ways of thinking about, about the relationship between water and urbanization. And those can broadly be sort of bucketed into, into process contributions, product contributions, and, and communication contributions, right? So people talked about the sort of sloppy thinking of design as being uh, conducive to generating new syntheses that would otherwise not be uh, possible. Um, in terms of products, people talked about the kind of multiple generating multiple benefits across different domains that, that in, a, in otherwise siloed processes again would not be would not be as possible. And then in the communication realm, which is one of the places that people again and again sort of uh, highlighted the role of design. One of the things that people often described to me was that the designers are particularly good at generating narratives, generating narratives and metaphors that are that are uh, productive for sort of. Uh, communicating these complex projects either to decision makers or to the public at large. So, but unfortunately, uh, there's also some, some sort of uh, negative sides that, that emerge as well, right? So, uh, my research suggests that, that in many cases, these sort of new rhetorical and, and imaginary uh, processes enabled by design are, are often actually promoting uh, what could what are sort of rebranded mega projects, is, uh, and this is. This is one of the, the projects, the proposals from the Changing Course Competition that I think, in my mind, sort of is emblematic of, of what is to, what is a, a kind of problematic re-embracing of a mega-project approach, right? So in, and these are folks who are engaged in, this, in the project who describe this as, we ended up in a big engineering <coughs> effect, we sort of were lamenting the fact of that. Of that. <coughs> and this is sort of this metaphor of using taps to turn on and off sediment water flow in the, in the lower delta, right? Which is a, an amazing um, embrace of the idea that we can we just we need more control, not less, right? So a lot of the the, the um, language around this this new paradigm of water management is that we're going to we're going to give up control in some way. But here we see that there's actually a sort of doubling down on controlling the flows of the, in the delta. Um, and then obviously, even when we, when there is a sort of shift away from a mega project approach towards a, towards a, a more distributed kind of green infrastructure approach, <laughs> there are these problematic aspects of uneven impacts, and this is the you know uh, an image that's, that's also familiar to most of us in the room probably. Uh, this is the green dot map from the immediate post Katrina uh, moment, which because of the sort of it was a proposal to to. Uh, radically de-densify certain low-lying neighborhoods to accommodate stormwater more effectively. Um, 
but these green dots that were that indicate where that was to happen uh, were disproportionately located in low-income and African American neighborhoods, uh, leading some critics to call this as a form of ethnic cleansing or race, race and class, class redlining. Um, <clears throat> And so the uneven costs and benefits of, of these adaptation processes, they inevitably are going to lead to conflict, to debate, to discussion about who, who should bear these costs and benefits. And, and so, actually, Josh, who's in the room here, this is a quote from one of, a paper of his where he's recognizing that you know, even if we do, uh, even if we frame these processes as a return to a sort of more ecological approach to, to managing the Delta, there's going to be, there's inevitable conflict that's going to, to come with this process. I mean, but unfortunately, what I, what I found is that, you know, all too often, designers are actually uh, not engaging with these conflicts. In many ways, we're actually kind of acting as, as depoliticizing agents to sort of paper over the conflicts rather than to, to, than to ra raise them and deal with them, which is what, what needs to happen if we're going to move these, these processes forward in, a, in a, a fair and just way. And so I've identified what I call four tools of, of design anti-politics that I'll describe briefly here. So one is urgency, right? So uh, this is this is a, a key one. Um, <laughs> so as, as you know, political ecology scholars have told us that that sort of mobilizing a sense of existential threat and urgency in the, in the sort of apocalyptic imaginary is a way of, can often be a way of, of evacuating dissent in a in a in any kind of a major project or proposal. That they, it sort of suggests that essentially there's just no time, right? There's no time to, to engage with, with a sort of messy deliberative process because things are just too, uh, it's just too urgent, right? This, the threat is too urgent. Um, the second, the second uh, tool that I'll describe here is, is this concept that, that uh, everyone can win, right? That we can have these massive reshaping of land use patterns and, uh, and infrastructural patterns but then in the end, everyone's going to win. And, and a favorite tool of designers that we, I consider myself a designer, uh, that, that we deploy is the, is the photo collage, right? So we can photo collage together people living together happily in any number of, of, of environments and, and sort of create an imagined future in which there is no conflict, right? And this is a great example of this from, from the, the um, changing course competition where we imagine these different coastal residents we have a tourists and coastal residents and urban residents, and basically they, they all agree that, that in spite of this, you know, installing all these taps on the river that are, that are going to radically reshape the landscape, basically everything's cool, it doesn't matter, everything's going to be fine, right? So we have the, the urban residents say, I don't even notice anything different. Everything seems about the same to me, right? So it's just sort of saying, everyone, there, there's no problem here, right? Moving on, move along. Um, the third tool that I'll talk about is this idea of, of landscape essentialism which is, is to say, in many of these processes, both in Dhaka and in New Orleans, my sites that I've looked most closely at, that means really emphasizing the, the deltaic character of these places. And in many ways, you know, so these are delta cities, right? So there's all this conversation about delta cities, delta urbanism, delta planning. This sort of really foregrounds the geophysical similarities between places, but it also often has the, the sort of subsidiary impact of de-emphasizing the socio-ecological and political differences. That, that may exist between otherwise you know, geophysically similar places. And one of the things that that does is it sort of creates a process where you can export generic approaches to climate proofing, right? And, and um, the Dutch have been, have been sort of at the vanguard of this, of this process. And then the last tool that I'll talk about is this idea of restorationism, right? Which is the idea that, um, that, that what we're doing here, even, even if it is radical, it's sort of somehow turning the clock back to a more harmonious way of inhabiting the landscape. Okay. And um, so, you, so that might be changing the delta back into what it once was, or looking to the wisdom of the past. And so <coughs> in my eyes, it like restoration, these restoration narratives can be a way of sort of softening or papering over the uneven costs and benefits that are going to come with the unmaking of the dry city, right? So what's, you know, on one hand, you can very reasonably ask, like, what is not to like about these three? Right? So these are urgent problems. You know, climate adaptation is urgent. Um, of course we should be looking for solutions where everybody wins. Of course we should be looking for sort of knowledge sharing between similar, similarly situated places around the globe. And of course we should be looking for you know, cues from the past for ecologically sensitive settlement patterns. Um, the problem comes when these frames are used to kind of obscure, the, obscure conflicts and debates that, that come up around these radical changes to landscapes and infrastructures. And so to me, I, 
building off of this research, I, I argue that designers and spatial planners can and should we, should, we should be playing a growing role in these processes, um, but then we really need to kind of be reflective about the tools that we use, uh, and in particular, sort of, these are sort of three ways in which I, I think we can engage more deeply with how, how we think about our role in these processes. One is to think about adaptation as a long-term process, right? This is a, a, a generations-long process we're, we're entering into. There's not going to be a time where cities can sort of check a box and say, we are hereby now resilient and adapted to climate change. So that requires a, a, a different way of thinking about how designers engage in these processes, which is to say that it is a process. And so we need to build Democrat, the, the ability to uh, disagree, to debate, to deliberate, and, and consider how design can, can play a role in those processes. We need to think about um, adaptation as not one big solution. Uh, it, this needs to be a pluralistic process, right? Where there, it's rooted in, in place, in history, and politics that recognizes that communities have different risk tolerances, they have different attitudes towards environmental resources. Um, all right, uh, error message here. Okay. Um, and then lastly, uh, we need to, designers need to, we need to embrace the idea. We need to recognize that, that putting forward images and imaginaries of the future is an inherently political process. And then we need to we need to deploy those the, that political power with a little bit more self-reflection and, and um, understand whose whose uh, whose interest we are advancing when we put forward these these images of imagined futures. So I think I will leave it there and uh, thank you all so much. Prior to colonization, uh, this place where we are now was called the Luncha. Um, in the Choctaw tongue, which was the Muscogee language, the major trade language that was used here in the Delta, uh, the Luncha translates to essentially mean place where many languages are spoken. Um, and as I look out at this river rolling by so swollen, <laughs> Um, I just want to acknowledge and give thanks for uh, its support in building this new land that we're on. Um, geologically, it's only been here for a couple thousand years. Um, and though what has taken Mother Nature a couple thousand years to create, it's also taken man a couple decades to screw up to a point where we're like, oh my god, what are we going to do? Um, and I think about that a lot. Um, yeah. This photograph, I, I start many, uh, almost all of my presentations with um, when I'm talking about Louisiana because it was taken in the Yakni Shido, which is found between the Atchafalaya and Mississippi rivers, um, which is experiencing some of the fastest land loss in all of South Louisiana, um, being ground zero for land loss. Um, on the planet as well. And my two great-grandmothers are, are pictured in the front row here on, on both sides. Um, and I just think that the structure in and of itself it says so much, not to mention the faces. Um, and you can notice the mud and moss chimney and the palmetto roof. Um, and the fact that this was taken in the late 1920s always makes me scratch my head. Um, and it was the photograph that my grandmother used to tell me about this place that she was from called Pointe aux Chiens, which means Point of the Oaks. Um, there's also the debate out it might be Point of Chien or Point of Chien, Point of Chien being Point of the Dog, Point of Chien, Point of the Oaks. Um, this photograph, I mean, sorry, map was made by a dear friend and collaborator um, who's a, a local um, artist and resident here in. Wawancha, Jacob Rosenzweig, and um, that, that highlighted part in the middle between the Atchafalaya and Mississippi is essentially the heart of the Yakni Shido, the, the big country. 
And I always say that the Homa uh, dodged the Trail of Tears by going deep into the Delta, and this is where they found their sovereignty and food security, most importantly. Um, my grandparents migrated to St. Bernard Parish in the 1940s, and that was due to um, a number of reasons. One is that land had been essentially stolen um, by the land grabbers, first the, the fur trappers, and then the oil and gas men who came in. Um, and of course, you know, this territory has been cut with thousands of miles of canals um, over the last couple of decades. And so my grandparents moved to St. Bernard, which is just south, um, about 20 miles from here, and that's where I live now, in the big toe of South Louisiana. Though our boot-shaped state looks more like a stiletto these days, so this is kind of, <laughs> this is a nice idea. It doesn't really look that way. Um, this image I just want to share is from, taken from um, Ponachan, um, and it was taken in 2010. We were doing a flyover during the BP drilling disaster. And, um, and a lot of South Louisiana's coast looks like this. Um, and we don't actually get to see this vantage because everything's so flat. But um, yeah, that's, you know, nature does not create straight lines, um, and nor does it make zigzags so perfectly. Um, so this is the Morganza to the Gulf uh, levee system. And um, just outside, beyond the, the terraces that you can see, those little speed bumps, um, that were, of course, man-made, um, is uh, Ile de Jean Charles, which we've all read a lot about. And a lot of my frustration is that, so I'm a citizen of the Holman Nation, um, and a lot of my family lives inside this, you know, they don't call it levy protection, they call it risk reduction. So we live inside, um, and as like everything rolled out with it, the island, um, and it was really frustrating in how the media was portraying the island as if it was happening uh, in its own little oasis of like destruction. And knowing that a mile away, my cousins were inside this risk reduction, um, but faced the same long-term um, challenges of, you know, being threatened that um, not all places will be able to be saved, um, and also being kind of given these false senses of security, in my opinion, by having this infrastructure put in. Um, this image uh, was taken in 2008 in a place called Grand Bois, which is uh, just north of some of the fastest disappearing land on the planet and just south of the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. Um, and also is, you know, a couple thousand feet from these open-air oil waste pits where they treat the material. Um, it's not hazardous, according to Louisiana law, but has hazardous characteristics, and it can't move from the facility. Um, but it's in a flood zone, and it floods just as the rest of the community floods. Um, of course, uh, those of you who are local, know that we've had this, and of course this happened up in the Northeast after Sandy, but these hazard mitigation um, grants for people to raise their homes. Um, this is my cousin Nacy in front of his home after one of the storms, one of those twins uh, that came through. I think this was I, Gustav and Ike, so 2008. Um, and he's raised his house another 10 feet since then, um, which is you know one of those things where you're like, oh, okay, um, they're raising homes that are, you know, they're, they're not like the best constructed homes and putting them 20 feet in the sky and telling folks that they're safe. Um, and yes, you may be safe from the water, but the wind is another story. So life in the red zone. Um, Anthony Fontenot and I have been having these very, um, hosting these informal uh, Delta Collective salons since Hurricane Katrina and just having people come together and chat about things. And one of the up, the, our, you know, we keep going back to is like that they're saying everyone should be kind of thinking of moving north, but what it, what would it look like to what is life going to look like in the red zone? And so this is you know the states like uh, 2050 predictions of land loss. Um, of course, when Hurricane Katrina came ashore, um, my grandmother was actually home with my father and 
other family members, and an 11-foot storm surge washed into our house in St. Bernard. And if you go to my home today, um, you know, the, the memory of that has kind of been erased, but the scar is still very much alive and present. Um, even though we've had some of the biggest uh, hard infrastructure, uh, this is the Southeast Louisiana Risk Reduction System known as the Shalmat Loop. Um, and in the picture it says the underpass is 19 feet, but you know, this wall, the Great Wall of St. Bernard, um, is almost 30 feet in some places, and uh, two or three years after they completed it in 2013, um, you know, we got these reports that in some places this wall had sunk between three and six feet already, and that was a couple of years ago. Um, of course, the Army Corps put in a uh, management monitoring system um, that cost like over a million dollars and said, don't worry, there's nothing to worry about, we're just putting this monitoring system in. But they failed to paint the, uh, the sheet piling with that like anti-rust stuff, so they just like put it into that like putting soil delta mud. So I don't feel very safe even though I'm <coughs> technically inside this reduction. Um, so these are some images that I just pulled from um, CPRA. Uh, when, in 2017 when I was going to these public meetings they were saying you know the, the best case scenarios of the 2012 plan Sorry, the worst case scenarios of the 2012 plan were the best case scenarios of the 2017 plan because um, sea level is rising so quickly and the modeling is showing mess, right? Um, and I can't help but like point out that there's a huge coal barge that's just passing by right now, just totally open air, just like cruising. Um, and that too is headed to flood zone depot just south of here. Um, so I think that, you know, for me, here's another, so this is just land loss, um, but this is your, your flooding depths, right? Um, and this is from, again, the 2017 plan. And I really struggle with, um, you know, how we're planning to fund our coastal master plan. I also struggle with the, the title of the master plan, um, being that before we had oil and gas and coal depots um, along the banks of the Mississippi, we um, had cotton and sugar cane. And where those plantations once sat, prisons and petrochemical plants now sit. And the majority of the funding going to our coastal master plan, um, the reason why they have real dollars right now is because um, we have these BP Deepwater Horizon disaster funds to go towards these projects. But into the infinite future, if you look at what I highlighted here, um, Go Mesa, the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, that pot of money is coming from deep water oil and gas extraction. So essentially the way the master plan is set up, not entirely, but you see the numbers here, um, we're leaning really heavy on oil and gas. Um, and I think that we need to remember that when we talk about this planning. Um, so they have, as part of the master plan, something they call non-structural adaptation, which actually has everything to do with human beings' structures. So it's um, either lifting your house, relocating people, or flood-proofing your businesses. Um, this is the island road um, going to the Ile de Jean Charles. And this I found um, just recently, and I just wanted to share it with you all, and I just want to point out the logos. Um, this is a pocket guide to funding resources for reducing coastal flood risk. Um, and as you see, Shell is uh, the main funder for the, you know, putting out this, this, plant, this pocket guide. Um, and when we look at you know, the fact that Shell is one of the big uh, explorers in the Gulf of Mexico. We have about 4,000 active leases. Of course, not all of those are in Shell's hands, but um, what is the relationship between corporations and communities? And I'm just going to share a few, because I'm running out of time, these images um, that have been layering USGS maps from the 1930s um, with 2015, and those little squiggly lines were land, and now they have blue on top of them because they're water. And this is the Pornishan Ridge, and then this is a photograph of the artifacts um, that can be found on, along the ridge. 
But as we're you know, considering these places that are um, changing so rapidly, and not only are the names being changed, but also they're being taken off of the maps. Um, and when you have oil and gas um, being part of the process and the planning, um, you know, what does that mean into the future? Um, and of course, we know, you know, they, oil and gas loves to tell us that, you know, in South Louisiana, you have oil and gas, or you have nothing, or maybe you have tourism now. A commodification of culture is a whole other conversation. Um, I work with Another Gulf as Possible, and we are currently um, trying to envision what this place could look like. And I think that we have to be honest about how we got here and recognize that, um, yeah, we, we, we've learned a lot of lessons. Um, we just have to remember them uh, as we move forward and recognize that um, the colonial system is still very much so in place here in the Mississippi Delta. It's just under um, the corporation, but you know, the company of the West Indies is why we call this place New Orleans, right? Um, so yeah, with that, I will close. Thank you. snippet of a study that I began in New York after Hurricane Sandy, uh, telling you the story of a community that came together after the storm and made the difficult decision to disperse itself, uh, to retreat rather than to rebuild. So I'll focus in particular um, on conflicts that arose over different ways of defining and managing risk, highlighting some of the issues and questions that this case raises that I think are relevant for our discussion today. So as some of you might recall, Sandy East Coast landfall occurred the night of October 29th, 2012. And in New York City, where I was living at the time, I was working on my PhD, the borough of Staten Island was one of the parts of the city that was particularly hard hit. Uh, so it saw the highest recorded water levels, the most deaths in the city, and the greatest proportion of residents affected in the borough. And this photo is an aerial shot of a neighborhood called Oakwood Beach, uh, where you can see that houses were, were swept it completely off their foundations and into the surrounding marsh. So one week after Sandy, this letter to the editor was published on the website of Staten Island's daily newspaper. The letter's author, Tina Downer, wrote about how she loved her neighborhood very much, but she decided that it was no longer a safe place to live. Soon after her letter appeared, Tina helped organize a community meeting. More than 200 of her neighbors showed up. They decided to uh, keep the meeting closed to public officials and the press. They only wanted residents of the area present to discuss their future. Uh, but at that meeting, they voted nearly unanimously in favor of pursuing government buyouts of their homes. So rather than stay and rebuild, they wanted support to relocate and for their homes to be demolished and the area permanently restored to wetlands. So a process that's becoming known as managed retreat. Following that meeting, Tina and a small group of her neighbors formed a group they called the Oakwood Beach Buyout Committee. And they put together a plan for buyouts and they started pushing it to local, city, and state officials. Less than three months later, in February 2013, New York State's Governor Andrew Cuomo traveled down to Staten Island and announced his support for a pilot buyout of Oakwood Beach. Uh, he praised the neighborhood for coming together. And he said that those who chose to participate in the new program would receive the pre-storm value of their homes, and you saw the condition of many of the houses in that neighborhood, and then they'd also get a set of incentives. They'd get incentives for their collective willingness to move, and they'd get a bonus if they relocated within New York City. <coughs> so at first, when news of the Oakwood Beach buyout broke, it seemed like an anomaly. Uh, even in places with recurrent disasters, people generally do not and do not want to relocate. <laughs> 
But before long, I watched as residents in other neighborhoods along Staten Island's shore began forming buyout committees of their own, modeled on the Beaches Committee, uh, and started pressing the state to expand its program to include them too. So this is a picture that I took in a neighborhood called Ocean Breeze. It's just a little bit up the east shore. This is from a meeting I went to in Crescent Beach, further down the shore. This is from a neighborhood called South Beach. It's close to the Verrazano Bridge. One of the signs says, Governor Cuomo, senior, sick, tired, broke, buy me out, please. And this is a picture I took in Graham Beach, where one man put signs all around his house asking for a buyout. This says, Governor Cuomo, Mother Nature wants her land back, buy us out, and give it back. <coughs> So in the weeks and months after Sandy, these buyout groups emerged all along the shore, asking the state to demolish neighborhoods that some of their members had called home for generations. But despite this, this widespread support for buyouts among residents themselves, uh, not everyone in the city thought that redrawing the coastline in this way was a good idea. So New York City's mayor at the time, Michael Bloomberg, uh, who often spoke of himself as the mayor to have reclaimed, in his terms, the waterfront for development, came out very strongly against retreat, which he cast as an unnecessary abandonment of the coast. Rather than unbuild in the face of growing risk, the mayor wanted to do the opposite. So the city created this plan that would offer homeowners that wanted to relocate roughly the same amount of money for their homes, but with the right to auction the land off to the highest bidder, someone who promised to rebuild in a flood-resilient manner, rather than permanently unbuilding the land as the state program promised. But selling one's land for redevelopment, so that, so that, as some people put it to me, a wealthy person could live there instead, felt very different in giving it back to Mother Nature, which many on Staten Island cast as a kind of sacrifice for the greater good, that's how they spoke of it, as giving up their land to create a natural buffer of open space that would help protect their neighbors, their larger community further inland, as well as protect taxpayers at large from paying out again in future disaster aid and insurance claims. So to mediate these competing government programs and conflicting visions of the future coast, the city and the state at first proposed using FEMA's flood maps as a way to decide which places were risky enough to warrant retreat. Uh, so homeowners in Zone V, the highest risk area, were told that they'd be eligible to apply for buyouts from the state. While those in Zone A, at the same risk of flooding, but um, a little bit lesser risk of storm surge, could apply to sell their land to the city for eventual redevelopment. Uh, this proposal proved enormously controversial, um, which probably won't surprise any of you familiar with FEMA's flood insurance rate maps. Um, first of all, because FEMA's maps, which were in the process of being revised in New York City when Sandy hit, did not take the storm's damage into account. They did not remotely map onto that damage. So as has become a familiar story in many places, including here in Louisiana, uh, in New York City alone, more than 21 square miles of flooded land during Sandy lay outside of FEMA's 100-year flood zone. But people took, also took issue with the way that by presenting risk as the static attribute of a place, uh, FEMA's maps worked to naturalize that risk and to erase its historical production. So older residents in particular would often talk to me about a time when the line between land and water in their neighborhoods was far less clear cut. Uh, when the homes sat like this on pilings in the wetlands and the creeks flowed in and out between them. This is the photo that one resident showed me of how his neighborhood used to look. But now, with the wetlands and creeks filled in, people who recall the way it used to be blame the chronic flooding that this neighborhood now experiences on the fact that the water simply has nowhere left to go. And part of the reason that people did not want their land to be developed once they left was because they blamed past development decisions for having produced flood risk over time. Uh, so the man on the right in this photo uh, he's standing in his backyard, and he said it was exactly the kind of resilient new development favored by the city that had contributed to the damage his own house suffered during Sandy. So he's standing here in front of what he called the wrong way seawall uh, that protected this new townhouse development adjacent to his backyard during the storm, but displaced water onto his family's own small wooden bungalow, destroying it in the houses of their neighbors. The plan to use FEMA's maps to delineate the boundaries of buyout areas frustrated people because the lines of risk on the maps transgressed social boundaries. They divided neighborhoods, they divided streets, they divided attached houses, and also buyout groups that had already been organizing. 
uh, making their own maps, as you can see here, of houses in their neighborhoods whose owners wanted to sell. And for a number of reasons, it ultimately became clear that FEMA's maps did not provide workable boundaries for retreat. And the state wound up relying largely on residents' own boundaries to define the two additional areas they eventually selected as eligible. So this case shows, you know, on the one hand, that retreat does not have to be top-down or forced. It can, and indeed should, be locally organized in a process that gives people a sense of agency and control. Retreat is about moving collectives as well as individuals. And to be effective at reducing risk, and not to mention sustaining cultures and social ties, it depends on collective action. Um, this is a photo of some of the houses that are part of the Oakwood Beach buyout. And you can see that, in this case, people were literally attached to one another. Um, and in some cases, you know, they didn't actually much like their neighbors, but they did care deeply what their neighbors did. Uh, and when it seemed like everyone on a block wanted to go, <coughs> pursuing a buyout became a way, um, kind of paradoxically, to affirm one's belonging and sense of social identity, uh, not abandoning. But at the same time, it's important to look critically at which identities and ways of life were affirmed, valued, and protected through the buyout process. Uh, so those who succeeded at getting bought out in Staten Island, you know, it was a fraction of those who organized, um, but they were predominantly white, working and middle class homeowners who had the political power and the connections to get their demands heard and to some degree at least met by the system as it stands. So they had what anthropologist Elizabeth Marino terms adaptation privilege, uh, afforded through policies like buyouts that are premised on property ownership and thus disproportionately exclude the poor and people of color. So exactly those who are disproportionately affected by storms like Sandy and other effects of climate change. And planning for the future that doesn't take into account the unequal landscapes that already exist threatens to obviously compound adaptation, or compound inequality and division through the process of adaptation. But even for those, you know, in Staten Island who were in a position of relative privilege, being in one of the wealthiest cities and one of the wealthiest countries in the world, resources to retreat proved incredibly hard to come by. So for these subsequent neighborhoods that did get bought out, it was only after eight months, and in one case more than a year, of just kind of constant organizing and pressure and letter writing campaigns and demonstrations and so on. Uh, buyouts have high upfront costs, and there are no clear guidelines for how to distribute buyout funding. Decisions about how to do so can easily lead to conflict. This was the case with FEMA's maps um, and the subsequent kinds of criteria that followed, um, which divide communities or are seen as opaque, undemocratic, or unjust. And as sites around the world become more exposed to floods, storms, and sea level rise, among other <coughs> impacts, uh, you know, people might expect retreat to be based on physical geography primarily, so on factors like elevation, like proximity to the coast. Uh, but in practice, you know, it's based as much on political, social, economic geography. We see retreat represented and increasingly now as inevitable and even desirable for some places. And these are typically places that have a long history of being viewed as expendable or peripheral. Uh, a point Carol Farbatko, a geographer, makes in relation to small island nations in an article called Wishful Sinking. But in other places and urban centers like New York City, retreat, even though it's happening, is still largely rejected as an impossibility, viewed as antithetical to progress and an unthinkable inversion of manifest destiny in spite of the extreme environmental risk. But the demands that I heard in Staten Island after Sandy point to somewhat of a paradigm shift in which even urban areas typically conceptualized in terms of growth are beginning to grapple with the idea of retreat. As the climate changes, people are moving, but there are vast differences and inequities in what that movement looks like and how it's experienced. People will be forced out, for instance, by rising flood insurance rates or exclusion from investments in coastal protection. Who will remain in limbo, um, as many people on Staten Island still feel they are, gradually displaced only to wind up somewhere potentially even more at risk. And who will be enabled to retreat and resettle on their own terms. So as climate change increasingly intrudes on everyday life, the disruption that results depends not only on the extent of warming and its effects, but also on how those effects are measured, mapped, and managed. 
and it remains to be seen whether retreat in the face of climate change works to further entrench inequality or conversely can foster forms of collective movement that are capable of being both just and sustainable. Thank you. Let's talk. Uh, I'm just going to delay ever so slightly to invite any of you who are moved to respond to these extraordinary provocations to raise a hand and claim the mic. Thank you. I, I just have a policy question. Uh, National Flood Insurance uh, Program is about to undergo a major methodological, methodological change where it's more micro, risk-based, the uh, height of the house, rainfall conditions. Any insights of how this is going to play out? What impact it perhaps you can do? Yeah, um, so I've written about this a little bit, and so there, there is this kind of move away, because the maps have proved so kind of impossible to, you know, the maps were considered good enough for a long time, so long as so long as they um, you know understated as much risk as they overstated, and it kind of balanced out. But as you have um, these pressures to raise insurance, to remove subsidies, and raise premiums to market rates, now suddenly, if you know the map's accuracy takes on higher stakes for people that are on one side of the line or the other, and, and so on. And so there's, um, you know, a group called Stop FEMA Now that's done a lot of organizing. It started in New Jersey after Sandy, um, and has spread across the country. And there's been a lot of activism fighting the new maps and fighting the increased premiums. Um, and a lot of the meetings I would go to, people would turn to me right away and say, are you zone A, are you zone B? You know, we're, we're kind of organizing around this. And now, as, as, you, as you mentioned, there is a shift towards doing these much more individualistic kinds of risk scores and moving away from potentially the 100-year flood zone entirely. And you know, my sense is that the question I have, I guess, is what that means for organizing, because I think the maps were very powerful in kind of creating this sense of a shared flood zone identity um, and, and did prove a powerful way for people to organize. Um, and it was something where neighbors who wouldn't necessarily talk to one another about their financial situations were really willing to disclose their flood zone, and it was something that people had in common. And so I think there are a lot of questions about what it means kind of socially to shift to a much more individual system. I would just say, uh, as part of the work we're doing, we are looking at um, some of these fast-growing parishes, places like Ascension Parish, where you really had 90 plus percent of the population that was flooded without flood insurance. And moving forward, what we found is that they've kind of grasped onto some of these elements of the National Flood Insurance Program that really don't make sense, uh, which is to say, okay, if you, if you fill a development high enough and get it out of the flood zone, you get a map amendment and you don't have to have flood insurance. And the parishes have really grabbed onto that. Um, but of course, what that does is flood all the communities around it. Uh, and to my knowledge, and based on the work we've been doing, that is not going to change. It is individualistic, but it still pits instead of, you know, kind of one community against another, it's pitting one development section is against another. And, and I've had the chance to see what it looks like to put 10 feet of fill on a development site that is building 300 homes, and it's pretty astonishing. So. Another question? Or? So, um, I think it's a really broad or really important point about funding um, and how funding works to shape how all these issues are talked about. I think academia and um, NGOs do a really good, good, really do good, a good job of identifying the issues and um, what we need to do to move forward. However, um, how we receive funding can limit how we talk about the issue um, in truth and really allow us to speak truth to power, to um, contribute to greenwashing and create goodwill for entities that are contributing to a problem and limit the ability 
for people to hold those entities accountable. Yeah, I have one quick response to that. I mean, one of the things that, that I've been looking at um, is the, the kind of growing role of private philanthropy and driving global scale um, climate change adaptation planning and around the country, around the world, uh, partly because state fund levels, the levels of funding from state and federal government are, are not anywhere close to adequate to, to do this work, right? And so, private, in many ways, it's, it's been a, a really positive thing that private philanthropy is stepping in and funding a lot of this work, you know, whether that's through Rockefeller or or others, but as you say, you know, those all of all of those resources come with particular sort of uh, ideological sort of orientations attached to them, and, and I think it is really really critical that we think about what it means when the funding for this stuff is coming from institutions that are not democratically accountable, um, and what kind of visions get advanced, uh, and what kind of processes get advanced because of, because of those uh, where that money comes from. Uh, so yeah, that's um, Yeah, I mean, I, I think about funding a lot. Um, and as a working artist here in South Louisiana, even, it's like, oh, am I going to do an exhibition here? And who is it Helis or is it Shell? Or and when you have the New Orleans Jazz Fest brought to you by Shell, and I think in this place like New Orleans, a bunch of, you know, we have this, um, you know, people have this idea of what this place is, and they immediately think if they're not from here, crawfish and Cajuns in Bourbon Street, Bourbon Street, they don't think that, you know, 25% of the nation's oil and gas is dependent on this place. And when we talk about, you know, those at the ends of the road who are facing these huge river diversions to come in um, and totally change the hydrology and change the way of life and everything. Like, you know, the decisions, as we've heard, you know, the decisions are getting made from the top down. And the people who are in the room helping to make those decisions are often the corporations. And in a place like South Louisiana, in a place like Louisiana where the government, you know, we can talk about the institution, but we're talking about our actual government is is so deeply connected to these funding streams. Um, you know, saying climate change is kind of like you know, the people they they're saying it in whispers now, which is a good thing. But you know, I mean, I think that yeah, what does it mean when the coast is brought to you by carbon? I, I don't know how that works. You know, and I don't think that we're talking about that enough. Like, I go to these meetings where there's hundreds of people, and they're like, oh, the master plan. You know, I don't want to be flooded, but they're not like, hey, and the funding stream, by the way, you know. So, yeah, I think we need to say it out loud now, for sure, and recognize how much influence they have on community. I mean, I, I'm from St. Bernard Parish, right? So, we have some of the worst air quality in the nation. We have two major oil refineries, had to drive by them. I gotta drive by and go on home. And we're a blue collar coast. So people are like day to day just trying to make ends meet and there are these multinational corporations that are reaping the benefits big time. And we have some of the worst air quality in the nation. You know, well, where we are is probably some of the worst air quality in the nation, though, you know, the tourism board probably doesn't want you to know that, but we take a deep breath. <laughs> By defining the problem as 
the government has intervened too dramatically in the market to try to create a kind of subsidy for homeowners. If that's the problem, then the, well, there's no, no possible solution at all. Um, similarly, I, I'm so struck by the urban resident who, whose goal, the problem, the risk that he poses is that life might change too much. The idea that somehow in New Orleans or Louisiana or America, the problem that most people would face is that nothing would, is that something might change, strikes me as totally opposite to most people's conditions. Um, for most people, the status quo is, is catastrophic right now. They want dramatic change. And sometimes I ask my students to do the thought experiment of, would you rather live in a just world with rising seas? Would you rather stop the seas from rising and continue with the inequalities that we have today? And for most people, this is, doesn't actually take very long to decide which they want, because we have the sense that these technocratic, even if we were to solve rising seas and global warming with a kind of technocratic, top-down, autocratic, technocratic solution, we know that that will fail us in the future. Our most enlightened plans for the future always fail. And if we've faced this, the possibility of democracy to address the new problem, then we're just dead the next time, if that makes any sense. Um, I'll say one more thing about Albancho because I think this is an important thing. I'm obsessed with whether the place for many languages is supposed to mean a kind of cosmopolitanism or something more like Babel. Do we live in a place that's defined by a kind of urbane ability to connect across difference? Is that the origin story of Louisiana or is it a total inability to understand each other. Uh, and we, we better aspire for the former, because that is, to my mind, the, that's the, the biggest risk that we're threatened by, is that lack of empathy, that inability to understand each other, the, the affirmation of the status quo and the market as the solution to the problem that it's actually caused in the first place. Um, so I'll leave it there and say, good thing we have all day to get to the solutions. Uh, and I'll turn things over to my colleague Fallon after I thank our wonderful panel.